Good morning. Well, it'll fill it'll fill out in here. Well, this is what happens when you start late every week. Eventually, everybody just adapts, and now they'll be five minutes late for the, the newly adjusted five minutes late start time. So we'll figure it out. It'll be it'll be just fine. My name is Paul. I'm one of the pastors here at Mercy Village Church. We're thankful that you're gathering with us here today. Uh, we it's simple. We're going to sing songs about Jesus. We're going to preach the word about Jesus. We're going to remember Jesus through communion. Uh, we're going to uh, read scriptures that remind us of Jesus. Because there's really nothing else for us uh, in the sense of healing or redemption or comfort or hope outside of Jesus. And so we're trusting him to meet us here in this place. We have some uh, core values. We have three of them to be exact. And and one of those, is, it reads like this. We are loved by God. So hear that today. You're loved by God. Even if you don't feel like it this week, it's true. You're loved by God. And then our response to that reality is that we will love God fully and we will love people selflessly. So that's something we desire for ourselves is that we would love people selflessly and in that uh, we are rooted in God's love for us. Only two announcements today. They're simple. If you're with us uh, for just the first or second, third time, you, you haven't been with us, but you want to get connected with what's going on at the Connect desk, which is that desk in the lobby on your way in, if you go there after... The gathering. We have a cup for you, a tumbler, whatever those things are called. It's got our logo on it, and it's got some information about the church inside of it, and a gift card to the human being as well. That's our gift to you uh, this week. So just uh, talk to somebody at the Connect desk on your way out, and we can get you that free gift. And then the very last Saturday of this month, save the date, usually from about noon to 3.30 we partner with Barbersville Community Outreach. And that's this month, we are the ones prepping the meal and uh, serving the meal at, at the Barbersville Community Outreach event, which uh, is just a group of volunteers from area churches. This is their mission statement uh, to, that came together in February of 2014 after recognizing that even in this prosperous community, which is true, uh, we have neighbors who struggle with hunger, isolation, and other basic needs. And so they put on a meal once a month to give a uh, community aspect uh, for those people's lives and to feed them. And we'll be the ones. Jeremiah is not here today, but he is the most recognizable person in this church. He is massive. Don't start a fight with him. And he's bald and has a beard. And sometimes he wears his biker cut. So you can't, you can't miss him. So uh, talk to Jeremiah if you want to be involved in helping with that. We got. I just wanted you to get it on your calendar. Last Saturday of this month. We'll have more information as we get closer. We're going to pray, and after we pray, we'll we'll read a welcome and we'll we'll sing together. What I want us to do, and we do this about once a month, and you you don't have to do it awkwardly. You just kind of side eye, or maybe you know exactly who's sitting next to you. Because what I want to do is as I pray, I want you in your hearts to pray for those people who are surrounding you, right? Like oftentimes we start almost every other week. We, we do this once a month. I ask you to pray for yourself, like that God will, will create in you a hunger for his word, that God will create in us an openness to the realities of the gospel today. But this morning, I want you in your hearts to be praying for those people around you that God will prepare their hearts for what it is that He has for them today. Father, thank You so much that You are here with us in this place. You cannot fail. You do not fail. You will not fail to bring to pass everything that You have planned for Your children. And so today, we have no... Um, we may have anxiety. We may have fear that You're not with us. We may have doubts about your ability to transform us. But those doubts or fears or anxieties, as real as they might feel to us, 
are not rooted in truth. The truth is that you are in this place preparing to meet your people here where we are. And so may our hearts be open to receive exactly what it is you have for us today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. My grace, streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise, and teach me some melody song, sung by flaming tongues of God, praise the mountain, fix the palm, mount of Irene. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hold by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Though to grace have Great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Born to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Born to leave the God I love. Seal it for the courts of God. Here's my Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for the courts of God. He who was before there was light Walked across the pages of time He who made every living thing Behold Him He who heard humanity's cry Left His throne to wake as a child He the least of us behold him Jesus son of God Messiah the lamb the roaring lion oh be still and behold him He who died with sinners and saints Healed the blind, the lost, and the lame Even now he is in our midst Behold him He who chose a criminal's end Paid with blood to settle our debt Buried death as he rose to life, behold him, Jesus, Son of God, Messiah, the Lamb, the Roaring Lion. Oh, be still and behold him, Jesus, Alpha. 
comes from Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24. It says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there are any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way of everlasting. Uh, this next song is called Christ Be Magnified. Um, and it's just talking about how, how great our God is. Um, so sing with me. <laughs> Creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry, and from north to south and east to west, we do Christ be magnified. Echoing his eminence, and his name would burst from sea and sky, and from rivers to the mountain tops, we hear Christ be magnified. Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified. When every creature finds its inmost melody, every human heart its native cry, oh, then in one enraptured hymn of praise, we'll sing Christ, be magnified. Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar. 
center of my life Christ be magnified in me I won't bow to idols I'll stand strong and worship and if it puts me in the fire, I'll rejoice cause you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings, I'll hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Cause death is just a doorway into resurrection life. And if I join you in your sufferings, then I join you when you rise. And when you return in glory, with all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing. My song will be the same. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let His praise arise. Christ be Um, dear God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for being here with us, be with us um, during the service. Um, please keep us all safe. Thank you for the sunshine today. And we love you in your name and pray. Amen. Kid, you are dismissed. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, our scripture verses today are Philippians 2, uh, verses 19 through 24. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon so that I too may be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son with a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. We say these words with me, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. All right, finish this uh, sentence with me. It should be pretty easy, I think. This is like crowd participation this morning. We ride together, we, we die together, right? And if you really have, you know, consume some really good cinema, then you might add bad boys for life, right? Like to the, to the end of that. Um, dear friends, like our dearest friends, the ones who we've endured hard times with, difficult times with, who have stood by us through um, those times, we sometimes refer to them as, as our, our ride or die friends. We're actually going to see today some of those folks for the Apostle Paul, some of those folks for the church at, at Philippi. So I would ask you, as we dive into this conversation, like, who are your ride or die friends? Who are those people? Kind of conjure up their faces in your mind. And then more specifically... Who within the family of God, right? Do you have friends within the family of God who you would classify as, as ride or die? These are gospel friends who are the ride or die type of gospel friends. Who are those people? Because what we'll see today in, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 30, is that when friendship between saints of God is rooted in our friendship with Jesus... We can experience some of the most selfless, loyal, and beautiful relationships. We're going to see that by example today. A lot of Philippians has been direct callings. Now Paul changes his tone and he, he talks about two of his friends. He 
tells us about. There's some instruction in these verses. He's really sharing with us the heart of these two friends of his. And what we see is that 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 friendship that we have with Jesus should spill out of us into our relationships with the people of God. We should experience deep friendships. We can experience deep friendships in Christ. Father, what we know not today, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You heard one of their names in verse 19. We meet Timothy. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon. In verse 24, it's actually verse 25. Yeah, sorry, I I miswrote that. The slide people saved me, though. I've thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. This will be the other friend. Two friends. Two gospel friends. The Apostle Paul's ride-or-die gospel friends. He had many. These were two of them. We'll start with Timothy. Twelve to fifteen years before this letter to the church at Philippi was written. It was written in about 62 A.D. It's about 62 years after the birth of Jesus. Jesus lives 30, is crucified around 30 or 33 years old, then this letter is being written around, maybe a little bit less than 30 years after the death and resurrection of of Jesus. That's where you're at in, in real life history at this time. 12 to 15 years before this was written, and we read about this and talked about this, the very first sermon in this Philippian series The Apostle Paul was on his second missionary journey. And on his second missionary journey, very early on in that journey, he picked up a passenger. Someone was added to the to the posse of saints that were going around planting churches, and it was Timothy. Timothy, as a young man, was raised by his mother and grandmother to love the truth about Jesus, to love the gospel. That was in his heart. However Paul exactly came to meet Timothy, we don't know. But we know that Timothy journeyed with him. And Timothy was actually there when the church at Philippi was born. He was, he was there when that demon-possessed girl who was following them around the city of Philippi, when Paul turned and, and commanded that demon to leave her, and she found transformation in Christ. Timothy was there next to the river when they met Lydia, the, the seller of purple and the... the uh, one of the main mobilizers of that church that was planted there in Philippi when she came to trust Christ and believe the gospel. He was there. He was not in the prison cell with Paul, only uh, Silas was, but he was there in Philippi when that Philippian jailer repented after the earthquake uh, as Paul and Silas were singing in prison. He was there. He saw all of this transpire. He would have known many of the saints on the on the very first core team of the church at Philippi. There's way more that we know about Timothy. We, we're not going to go into all of it. He was a dear partner in ministry to Paul. Very dear friend. There's two letters in your New Testament that are addressed to this man, Timothy. First and second Timothy, ironically. They really stretched for the names of those books. He was a very dear friend of Paul and a very um, loyal, faithful minister of the gospel. And so, Paul talks about him first. Verse 19, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you so that I too may be cheered by news of you. Paul does have an ulterior motive, by the way. And there's two. There's a difference between Epaphroditus and Timothy and their mission, their proposed mission. Neither of them have been sent yet. Paul just writes that he's thinking about it. Paul Paul is, you can pick up, and you'll pick up in a couple other places, he sees the mission for Timothy to go to visit the saints of Philippi and then to return to Rome where he is imprisoned and to report back to him what's happening in Philippi. Epaphroditus, I don't want to give anything away about him yet, we'll get to him in a second, is is going to stay in Philippi. That's the plan that Paul's talking here. So Timothy, he says, I hope to send him. And one of the reasons I hope to send him is so that he can return back to me and I can hear and celebrate what God is doing in your lives from his firsthand account. And so that's Paul's hope. 
he goes on to describe Timothy, and, and I love this. And this is where we see what it means to be a loyal, ride-or-die gospel friend. This is the character, some of the character traits of a, of a gospel friend. For I have no one like him, he says in verse 20, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. Genuinely concerned for your welfare. Not fake concern. He's not going to feign concern and interest. Genuine, heartfelt concern. You've met both types of people, Lord willing, in your life. Lord willing, you've met the other type of person because the fake type of people can very much make your heart jaded. Think that nobody cares. These people say they care, but when the rubber meets the road, they don't really care. They're not ride or die. They are say they care, but they lied, right? He, he, this is genuine. He uses the word genuine on purpose. He cares about you, saints, and Philippi. I know it. I've seen it in his heart. I know that it's true. From they, and again, they is not anyone specific. He's just generally talking about those who aren't like Timothy. They, those who aren't like Timothy, all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. In doing that, he's stating the opposite of what Timothy is. Timothy is concerned with the interest of the church of Philippi. And he deeply is interested in the mission of Jesus. He is a selfless servant. Timothy, in verses 19 through 24, is shown to us to be a selfless servant. Verse 22 reveals his his servant heart. But you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me In the gospel, side by side, arm in arm, from the planting of the church of Philippi and on from there, he has served faithfully in the mission of the gospel. So there you have the first character trait described to you in the life of Timothy, a selfless servant. So Paul describes his plan for Timothy. Verse 23, I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. Now, what's interesting here, and this is just nerd. Not, it's, I don't think it's nerdy. I think it matters. Like, we should be wondering what Paul's up to here. Like, it should matter to us. Like, like what does he mean when he says, when I see what will come of me? But I think that, that, that two, if you, that's why the context matters. He's in prison, almost certainly in Rome. He doesn't know what's next for him. You can tell by his lingo, and that's the great thing about going through this book verse by verse, you've seen him several times express his uncertainty about whether he's going to live or die. There's something happening legally in association with his imprisonment that maybe is there's some more information about his sentence or about whether he's going to be set free that he's waiting to be handed down. That's what he means. Again, that don't hear that as just informational. Hear that to, to feel Paul's heart as to where he is. If you've ever been in a place where you're waiting on news, in particular, if somebody else has control of the outcomes, then you can get a sense for how Paul felt in that moment, waiting for the the word here in a legal sense. Am I going to live or am I going to die? Am I going to be set free or am my imprisonment going to continue? He he evidently felt like there was going to be news handed down to him soon. And he says, as soon as I get word of what that is, I I hope to send to send Timothy to you when I see how it will go with me. And I trust the Lord too, Paul says, that shortly I myself will come also. Church history is pretty certain that Paul never makes it back to Philippi. But Timothy probably does. Almost certainly does. Makes it back to see the saints who are there. But here's the point. Saints, are we selfless servants? Right. One of the things I would challenge us to do today is not only think about who our gospel friends are, but ask ourselves, are we gospel friends? Do we manifest these realities as we move towards other people? Are we selfless servants? It's convicting for me. Over the summer, we looked at Jesus washing his disciples feet. When we were going through eight distinctives of, of Mercy Village Church. Two weeks ago, we saw the humble nature of Jesus in the first 11 verses of 
of Philippians chapter 2. This is the standard of what selfless service looks like. The standard's not Timothy. The standard's Jesus. Selfless servants. Are we selfless servants? We state it this way in one of our distinctives. We say we desire to be people who practice selfless ministry. That's here in this church. Selfless ministry as a, as a lifestyle that, which pushes it outside of the church. We want to be those types of people to our neighbors, to our friends, to, the, to, the, to our families. When we feel like it and when we don't. When others are watching and when they're not. When it costs us nothing and when it costs us everything. This will influence the way we develop leaders and volunteers and how we measure their success. Selflessness, humility, and sacrifice will matter more than talents, charisma, or expertise. We will generously, joyfully, humbly, and sacrificially steward our gifts and resources for the good of one another and kingdom advance. We didn't come up with that because it looked like any of us. We came up with that because it looked like Jesus. And Jesus can make us look like that. But the question for us today is, are you a selfless servant? Are your relationships about you? Or are your relationships about others? Are your relationships contractual? Quid pro quo? Or are they sacrificial? Timothy verses 19 through 24 shows us a selfless servant. Verses 25 through 30 introduce us to Epaphroditus, the persevering partner. We know even less about Epaphroditus than we do about Timothy. Infinitely less. What we do know all comes from the book of Philippians. He was from the church of Philippi. This is his home church. These saints at Philippi, he was one of them that this letter was addressed to. And we'll learn in chapter 4 more about this detail, but he had been commissioned by the saints at Philippi to go to Rome with a gift for Paul to give to him there in prison. We don't know even exactly what the gift is, but we'll learn more about it in verse in chapter 4. So he goes with this gift, and not only that, he goes to minister to him, to, to bring encouragement and love and, and, and peace from the church of Philippi to them. He'd come for that purpose. And that's about all we know, except for what Paul describes to us now. Verse 25, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus. Now, see this guy's resume. This is great. My brother... That's one of the things he was to Paul, a brother. They had a shared heart. But if what, what they had in the gospel felt like brotherhood. They had a shared heart, Paul says. He's, he's my brother. He's my fellow worker. They had a shared mission. They saw eye to eye when it came to what was most important to do in this life. And, and he was a fellow soldier. They had shared scars in the ministry of the gospel. They bled for the same things. They fought for the same things. There's beauty in that, by the way. In the sense of we come into this place and maybe we don't share even even 20% of everything else in our lives in common. We obviously share a lot in common as far as geography and places we live, work and play. Like Those things are similar. So the vast majority of us are going to have a measure of things in common. But even if that's only like 20% of our lives or 25% of our lives that we have in common. You ask any soldier who served in, in battle with someone. Who, who has, it doesn't matter if they like the same music. It doesn't matter even if their politics are exactly aligned. If you've shared a foxhole with somebody. If you have a common enemy. If you've experienced common wounds. Common attacks. Common places of struggling. There's a deep bond that's outrageously difficult to set from doing life in the midst of fire together. That's who Epaphroditus was. To Paul, they had a shared heart, a shared mission, and shared scars. He meant something to Philippi as well. He goes on in verse 25. He was your messenger and minister to my need. They trusted him. Like when the church at Philippi thought of all their people, they like pulled out the 
church's role, you know, or whatever, and like looked at the list of names. Maybe they had an Excel sheet or something with everybody's names in it. And they pulled it up. They said, who do we trust to take whatever this gift is? So he has to be an honest man of integrity that we can trust to transport this. He got to have a little bit of toughness, can go by himself. You know, it's not safe necessarily to to travel. I mean, you get that even now. It's not always safe to travel, but even then, probably more so dangerous to travel. And we want him to convey to to Paul our love for him. So he's got to have some tenderness, too. He's got to be this tough and tender man of integrity that we trust and know will deliver this. Epaphroditus, he's the guy. So we don't know much about Epaphroditus, but man, the guy was legit. God bled with some people. God had shown himself to be honest. God had shown himself to be loyal. God had shown himself to be faithful. So he's the one who they sent. And here's where Paul really makes an emphasis, though, of why we see Epaphroditus as a persevering partner. Because it gets even worse, it gets bad for Epaphroditus when he gets to Rome. Verse 26. I want to send him back to you, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. We don't know much about his illness, but we know that it was severe. You'll see that in a second. He'd evidently traveled to Rome on the way there, or once he got there, he gets very, very sick. News gets back to the church at Philippi, and Epaphroditus' biggest worry, and this is so Epaphroditus of him, he's it's, it's so Epaphroditus of him, to not be worried about himself, but to be worried about their anxiety, about him. He's an empath, right? Isn't that what the term we use now? If someone has experiences other people's emotions when they're feeling them. This guy's tough. This guy's a man of integrity. This guy's a, a soldier in the gospel. He's scarred, right? But, but to be that way, he didn't have to turn off his emotions. He, he can feel what other people feel. And his greatest concern, he's this tough and tender man, Epaphroditus, is, is not for his own healing, but it's, man, I bet they're flipping out. Philippi. I bet they're anxious. News didn't spread as quick back then, right? You didn't just pick up the phone and call. Like, oh, by the way, he's feeling a little bit better. He's fine. No, he's like, that. they don't know how I am. And I'm worried for them. Uh, for he's been longing because that's verse 27. Indeed, he was ill. That really did happen to him. Near to death. So it was severe. But God had mercy on him. And not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. The Apostle Paul is not turned off his emotions either. And this is important. Because the Apostle Paul has done ministry. The Apostle Paul has done travel. The Apostle Paul has been in the public square. He has been wounded physically, emotionally, spiritually by other people. And he has continued to lay himself out there for the sake of others. And he and, and, and by that point in his ministry in prison in Rome, you know what I would have done? I would have said, OK, Epaphroditus, thank you for the gift. It's good to see you. I know a good doctor who can help you with your sickness. But man, I don't want to get tied up relationally. I'm scared. To you. I don't want to open myself up again to somebody else, especially in the church. You met these church people? They can be mean sometimes. They'll turn on you quick. No. Paul lays himself bare once again to Epaphroditus. <laughs> this guy dies, man, I will be wrecked. If something happens to Epaphroditus, I'm going to be wrecked. He he was connected deeply to him. So that's Epaphroditus. He comes to Rome, gets sick almost dies, and in the midst of his near-death experience, he's, he's worried about the saints at Philippi. And so, so Paul says, that's why I want to send him back. Verse 28, I'm more eager, based on this reality, that you guys actually aren't going to know how he is probably till this letter gets there. I'm all the more eager to send him. Therefore, you may rejoice in seeing him again. Paul says this, that I may be less anxious. I know I just emphasize this with Epaphroditus, but Paul had empathy too. I say that in particular for those of us in this room who think that what it means to be tough 
requires us to turn down our emotional awareness. Our emotional engagement. It's just not representative of, of at least the heroes of the, of the Word of God. In particular, the men, right? And, and stereotypes prevail oftentimes in places like Appalachia. Not only here, but other places as well. That men are not supposed to feel things. The Apostle Paul, who is certainly tougher than me, probably tougher than a lot of us, says, man, I want him to be with you so that the anxiety you're feeling for him can be eliminated. And when it is, I don't have to feel anxious anymore either. Because his emotions are, he's not afraid to let his emotions be tied up with their emotions. So take that for what it is. It's just an observation from the from the text. He says in verse 29, so receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. He says, I don't just have a plan that when from his perspective, when he arrives, he shares the good news with you. You're encouraged. But also I have expectations for you, Church of Philippi, that you honor this man. You show him the honor that is due to him. Because the little mission you sent him on, in a roundabout way, nearly cost him his life. Don't miss that. And now, the whole time he was sick, all he cared about was you guys. This is a, this is a legit guy that you need to honor when he comes back into your midst. And he just reiterates that in verse, in verse 30. For he nearly died for the work of Christ risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. He did this for you, and he almost died doing it. Honor him. Epaphroditus was a fighter. Epaphroditus was a persevering partner. I don't know how many of you geezers out there remember Simon and Garfunkel. Does that sound familiar? They knew how to make music. Nobody does anymore. Let's be real. Let's just be real about it. They had a book or a book. They had a song called The Boxer. And towards the end of the song, there's these lyrics in the clearing stands a boxer. A fighter by his trade. And he carries the reminders of every glove that laid him down and cut him till he cried out in his anger and his shame. I am leaving. I am leaving. But the fighter still remains. See, if Epaphroditus had been laid open in the service of the Lord, he'd been cut, he'd been wounded, he'd been knocked down. Paul had too. The fighter still remains. He was a persevering partner in the gospel. Saints, are we persevering partners? Or when the going gets tough, do we keep going? Now, I have to clarify this. I think it's so important. I didn't say when the going gets toxic, because we're talking about relationships here too. This is in the context of relationships. I didn't say when the go, going gets toxic. I said when the going gets tough. The going gets tough, right? That's you have a loyal friend or you yourself have situations that come into your life that when you look at them, you say, this is going to be impossibly hard. That's tough. Toxic, we, we throw, there's a lot of these words that get thrown around now, but the real meanings of them apply to things like gaslighting, things like um, no repentance, no signs of change, no signs of transformation. People who, who continue to take advantage of you in ways that are obviously not healthy. What we'll tend to do, though, sometimes when we want to bail out of tough situations is we'll place the toxic label over top of them so we don't have to feel so bad about walking out. I say we, there's a pig in my pocket, I. Put the label toxic over some tough situations that aren't actually toxic because I want to be able to walk away. Know the difference. Your pastor isn't telling you to stay for the toxic. But your pastor is saying that we are expected to stay through the tough, the tough situations. When the going gets tough, do you stay faithful to the gospel and to each other? We look to Jesus to see this reality played out. We don't. Timothy and Epaphroditus 
show it to us imperfectly. Jesus shows it to us perfectly. He was the selfless servant, verse 45 of Mark chapter 10. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Selfless servant. Not only that, but the Bible says in other places that even while we were still sinners, he died for us. It was our sin that caused his suffering, and still he died for us, the selfless servant. Jesus was also the persevering partner, Hebrews 12, 2. Looking to Jesus, the founder and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. He was our persevering partner. And this was displayed most crystal clear at the cross. If you're not a Christian, what I want you to see today is the cross of Jesus Christ. That's what matters the most because they're the selfless servant, Jesus, and the persevering partner, Jesus, the Bible says, supernaturally, not just historically. Historically, he died on the cross. It's, it's objective reality in the sense, if you, unless we're just going to throw all the history books and all that stuff out the window. It, it really happened. It's, there's no doubt about it. But in that historical moment, Jesus was absorbing the wrath of God against sin. On behalf of sinners like you and sinners like me. His suffering was for a purpose. His selflessness was for a purpose. His perseverance was for a purpose. So that he might bring us into partnership with God by grace through faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Believe that what Jesus did on the cross when he died, was buried and raised again, was enough to make you right with God. Believe that today. If you're not a Christian, believe that today. And just because you've grown up in a Christian home doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you've gone to church a thousand times doesn't make you a Christian. This is a personal decision between you and God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Make that your reality today. I'd love to talk to you about that if that's that's not the case for you. Saints, here's where we close. You have a friend. Before you think about being a friend... Remember that you have a friend. Jesus, hear him today speaking to you. We buried people this week as a church. I don't know how many of you knew that. We did. One person, not multiple people. I want to spread false information. Someone in a family in our church died unexpectedly this week. I stood there Friday evening and I prayed these exact words that I'm going to quote right now. Because even when you don't feel it, it's true. Even when Jesus doesn't feel like your friend, it's true. He says to you, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. All those... We put people in the ground this week. All those who are worn thin by whatever it is that you have going on or not going on in your life. Come heavy. Come burdened. He'll give you rest. You have a friend. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Your friend is gentle and lowly in heart, and in his presence you will find rest for your souls, for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Being a friend can even be that burden. Being a friend can be that thing sometimes that makes you feel heavy laden. And so if you're going to be that friend, you have to know that you have a friend. And he never sleeps. And he never rejects you. And he never casts you out. And he always stands there with open arms saying, come to me, come to me, come to me. You have a friend. That doesn't get us off the hook. Having the friend doesn't get us off the hook. It's it's about walking with Jesus, your friend. And where he is walking is in the pathway of being selfless servants and and persevering partners. And so if you're going to put the easy yoke on of Jesus, and you're going to rest in the fact that, that Jesus is the one pulling the yoke, but you're going to walk next to him, then that's where you're going to go with him 
He's going to take you there. He's going to help you in that. He's going to empower that to happen. But you're going to go in the, in the direction of selfless servant and persevering partner. So some questions for us as we close. In what relationship and in what way do you need to let go of self-interest? In what relationships and in what ways do you need to let go of self-interest? Timothy showed us what it is to be a selfless servant and perfectly Jesus showed us it perfectly. What are those places? What are the specific relationships? And what are the specific ways that you need to let go of self-interest? Yoke up with Jesus for learning and empowerment. He will teach you and empower you to follow through with where those points of need are. Question number two, where are you struggling to persevere right now? Where do you feel like you can't go on? You don't have what it takes. Where is that place in your life? Yoke up with Jesus for rest and for endurance in those areas. And then here's the last question. Who are your gospel friends? With that also comes a question, are you being a gospel friend? Which is the point of application here. Who are your gospel friends? And how will you intentionally invest in them this week? This week, specifically. I'm a little bit like two minutes faster than normal this week. That's a miracle. Um, I've asked that they, like, one of the, we were at a conference in Brooklyn a few weeks back. And one of the things they did was at the end of every session, this guy got up there and he said, okay, before we just roll out of here and forget everything we just talked about, we're going to play music for like three minutes. And I want you to write down some stuff that you're going to take away from this. I said, man, that's a really great idea. And it's a fit for today. And I knew we were going to be short today. So for the next two minutes, we're going to play some music. And what I would love for you to do, if you don't have somewhere to write it down, then pull out your phone and write it down. Like actually apply. We'll leave the questions up there on the, on the screen. Answer those questions in this moment while the music plays. And then we'll close. Oh God, before the mountains were brought forth, or oh, days of spring and summer fill the earth from everlasting. You are God. We dwell beneath the stars in ancient skies. A thousand years are nothing in your sight. From everlasting, you are God. And all our days are held within your Hopefully you at least got started thinking about that. 
It would be my prayer that even when we don't have time to do that week to week, that that we wouldn't just leave here without seeing how this directly applies to our lives. So keep thinking about it if you didn't have answers to all those questions. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you the answers to those questions because they'll directly impact how we live this out. When friendship between saints of God is rooted in the in our friendship with Jesus, we can experience some of the most selfless, loyal, and beautiful relationships. Might we be those types of friends to others in the week to come and, and throughout our, our lives. Father, thank you so much that you've been a friend to us. In fact, you call us friends. More than that, you call us sons and daughters because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross, our ultimate example of what it is to be a selfless servant and a persevering partner. Might you work individually in all of our lives in this place and throughout the week to come that we would find and be selfless servants, those types of gospel friends. That we would find and be persevering partners and have those types of of gospel friends. Make it so by your good grace. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I'm going to read our passage for communion. Uh, I'm, and then I'll stand up here with the elements. You come and take them, return to your seats, and then we'll partake of them together at the, at the same, same time. 1 Corinthians ch- chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. For I received from the Lord, this is Apostle Paul writing. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. That's a call to to sit in your seat and examine your heart a little bit if you need to before you take the meal. If there's some things that you need to repent of or pray about in that space, there's time for that to happen. Let a person examine himself then and so eat the bread and drink the cup or anyone, for anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So as you're ready, come, take the elements, return to your seat, and then we'll all partake together. In a mysterious way that we can never claim to understand, Jesus is present with us in this meal. Beyond that, symbolically, we remember. So both we eat spiritually with Jesus, not physically. One day we'll eat this physically with him. We spiritually are eating with him and we are also remembering Christ's body broken for you. And Christ's blood shed for you. Father, thank you for the finished work on the cross. Thank you that you set us free to be selfless servants and persevering partners because you, through your son, demonstrated what that looks like. And not only that, but you saved us and empowered us to the same. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Receive the Apostles' Creed as your benediction. If you want to read along with me, you can. Uh, There's three slides. This is the Apostles' Creed. Long-held beliefs by Christians all throughout the world. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived from the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, who suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, rose again from the dead on the third day, ascended into heaven, is and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, who will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Go in peace.